Hello everybody and welcome to the sixth lecture. Uh, today we're going to be talking about radiation and mass. So um, nuclear engineering is a study of how radiation interacts with materials. Um, and mostly we care about uh, neutral, particle, neutral particles that are incident, so neutrons and photons. Um, and these are really important because they can affect they can effectively ignore the electrons in an atom, right? So they, they are, since they're neutral, they don't experience the uh, electromagnetic repulsion that a charged particle, or attraction that a charged particle like another electron or, the ad or another atom, the valence shell of an atom, or a proton would feel. Um, and so basically what they interact with is the nucleus. Um, so, to start out today, let's go ahead and dive into a taxonomy of all the different ways that um, neutrons, in particular, uh, can interact with the nucleus. Okay. So, we're going to start with neutron interactions, and um, in particular, let's go, we're just going to go through all of the various uh, types. So but to start with, um, we'll do elastic scattering. Um, and sometimes this is abbreviated as an N comma N reaction. Okay, so uh, as a little schematic here, what's going on with a neutron uh, an N uh, interaction is say a neutron comes in and it hits an atom and then a neutron a single neutron leaves. So you can view elastic scattering as um, when uh, a, a one neutron comes in and it bounces off elastically off of, uh, off of the nucleus. Okay? So we'll see. We'll say, uh, oops. Um, so this is when. Do, 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 actually, I'll just do it here. Um, neutron uh, collides with nucleus. Um, so you can view this as a neutron colliding with a neutron with a nucleus. Whoops. And a neutron is emitted in the ground state. Okay? So that's elastic scattering for you. Um, along with uh, elastic scattering is, as you guessed it, inelastic scattering. So what happens with elastic scattering is that the neutron might uh, change direction um, and therefore and change energy, um, but the total energy of the system is still uh, conserved. Um, or the energy uh, is entirely captured within the motion of the neutron and the atom before and after the collision. Inelastic scattering is when um, some energy is lost. So this is called N, this is sometimes abbreviated as NN prime. Um, and to go and draw a little description of this, so uh, let's actually, so. Let's say, say that we have a neutron coming in Oops. to an atom. Oops. That atom could be bigger. So a neutron comes into the atom. Uh, a neutron leaves. This is n prime. But in the process, a gamma particle is, let me, let me do that. Nope. <laughs> Technology. So, a gamma particle, 
Oh, come on. Uh, gamma wave is also produced. Okay. Um, so the, the neutron gives up some of its energy to the nucleus itself. Um, and uh, the nucleus may be left, or the nucleus is, is left in an excited state, which then very quickly decays down into this gamma. Oops. Um, so going back to the definition here, so let's say, we'll just say a neutron, uh, or similar to elastic scattering. Except that the neutron gives up some of its energy to the nucleus. Okay. Um, uh, and then after that, the nucleus is left in an excited state, which very quickly uh, decays back into a ground state by emitting one or more gamma particles. Okay. All right, so that's one form. Um, another form is called radiative capture. So this is abbreviated as N-gamma, okay? So, um, uh, this is when a neutron is absorbed into the nucleus. Um, I'm gonna get myself a new. Uh, what, this is when a neutron is absorbed into the nucleus, and then the nu nucleus um, emits a gamma. So a neutron comes into the nucleus of an atom, and then out of that atom. Uh, Uh, gamma particle uh, leaves. Okay. All right. Um, or or potentially more more than one gamma particles. So uh, just to write this down here is when a um, uh, uh, yeah a neutron is absorbed into the nucleus um, any excess energy um, above ground is released as gammas. Okay? Um, the next kind of uh, interaction is called proton production. So this is abbreviated as N, or this is denoted as N comma P. Um, very similar to the way, very similar to the way that uh, the radiative capture works in proton production, as you might have guessed. Uh, oops. A uh, neutron comes in. No. Uh, to a nucle uh, hits a nucleus, um, and a proton uh, is emitted. Okay. Oops. Rather than uh, rather than a neutron or a gamma ray. Okay. So. Um, to define that here, um, neutron is absorbed 
into nucleus and a proton is emitted. Um, so this is both, I should know, atomic number preserving. So a number preserving. Uh, but not z number preserving. Right, so your nucleus loses positive charge, and I'll just say that this is a relatively rare reaction because of that. Not not impossible, but uh, relatively rare. All right. So moving right along, um, we have alpha production which as you might have guessed is when a neutron comes in and an alpha particle, right? So that's the helium nucleus, helium four nucleus, an alpha particle is emitted. So um, uh, going back to the, the board, um, so we can draw this, um, uh, we get, uh, neutron coming in to an atom or to the nucleus of an atom and then the much heavier alpha particle is emitted. I'll go back and just say um, yeah neutron is uh, absorbed and alpha particle is emitted. Okay. Um, all right. So nothing requires that A numbers and uh, Z numbers or any kind of thing be preserved in these reactions. Um, moreover, there's a whole suite of neutron producing reactions. So this could be like N, one neutron, N to two N, so that's when two neutrons are pr uh, produced, or N comma three N when three neutrons are emitted, etc. And so this is really when more more than one uh, are produced and emitted. So, um, for example, right, you have a single neutron come in to a nucleus, and then for an N2N reaction, you would get two neutrons. Oops. And for an N3 reaction, you would get three neutrons, etc. Um, so, oops. Um, yeah. So a neutron is absorbed, and more than one neutron is or more than one neutron, neutrons are emitted. Um, and then a relatively famous example of this um, is if you have a neutron plus uh, plus deuterium, so hydrogen two, this goes to um, uh, hydrogen one plus two neutrons. So you get this uh, reaction here, which is, uh, yeah, not so bad, right? Okay, so that's one way to produce two neutrons. So you can have a self-sustaining chain reaction with just uh, deuterium. Uh, okay.
deuterium and some neutrons. So, uh, uh, moving right along is what we'll call neutron induced fission. Um, and this is abbreviated as NF. So you might recall from our discussion of spontaneous fission, um, it, uh, uh, it, a spontaneous fission, right? The word fission means to break or to split or to cut. Um, and so it's when uh, the atom itself it, is split into multiple pieces. So um, you have a neutron coming in to an atom and then uh, beforehand and then afterwards you get, as you'll recall, sort of like, it's too big, uh, like s sort of two major components flying off um, with some distribution and then probably some neutrons. Um, maybe more than one, maybe like up to five or six sometimes even. And then whole bunch of junk, you know, some gammas, probably some, uh, and etc. Uh, so it's when the it's when the neutron actually splits, up, or when the neutron causes the atom to split apart. And this is much more common uh, than the spontaneous fission, which, as we uh, in when we were discussing radioactive decay, that's relatively relatively rare. So. Neutron interacts the nucleus and causes it to completely split apart. Um, the results are similar as for spontaneous fission. Okay, so um, this is sort of, this is like the big idea. Uh, these are most of the main kind of uh, um, main interaction types that we talk about when we deal with neutrons uh, interacting with matter. There are others, of course, um, more uh, esoteric ones, but these are kind of the big ones that drive a lot of nuclear engineering-based systems. Okay, so um, with that said, let's go ahead and start talking about, let's do an intro to cross-sections. So um, we know that atoms are mostly made up of empty space, right? So the likelihood of, of atoms interacting uh, with a neutron at, at, at first blush, right, is vanishingly small, right? Because the nucleus, as we discussed before, is this tiny, tiny fraction of the total space of an atom, right? Um, however, there's a bunch of different physical forces that come into play. Um, and so the likelihood of an interaction, quote unquote, is greater, um, uh, is typically much greater than uh, the likelihood of just a direct collision, like of a neutron just immediately um, coming in uh, and physically colliding, though that can happen too. So. As an example of this, uh, or as a physical, another physical analogy, um, let's consider uh, an asteroid colliding with Earth, okay? Um, and so say we've got Earth over here. Um, this is our home. We all like it and we don't want to die um, by this asteroid. <laughs> um, and so, um, uh, and then we've got some asteroid at some distance d 
uh, or some distance r, sorry, away. And the asteroid is, oops, the asteroid is moving with a velocity v. Okay? Um, well, uh, so, and then there's, and then the asteroid, whoops, so maybe this is where Earth is um, along this axis, and the, a the asteroid is itself some distance d uh, from this axis, okay? Um, or actually, oops, sorry, did this wrong. Uh, uh, let me erase this. So this, this should be, oops, I'm really not doing well today. Um, sorry, so this should be D and this should be R. Okay. Um, well, if you set R to be less than the, or the radius of the Earth, um, right, then you would get a collision, obviously. That's less physical collision. That's sort of like elastic or inelastic scattering. Um, however, we've got another thing at play, right, and that is gravity. Um, and so we know, right, from mechanics that F, the force of gravity, oops, is equal to big G times the mass of the asteroid times the mass of Earth divided by the radius or the distance between them squared. Um, oh, so maybe this is, uh, yeah. Right, so this, if d was zero, this would be true. So let's, we could do this as, oops, uh, x and y, and then this hypotenuse is r in this case, okay? Um, so, because of gravity, because gravity uh, uh, and the mass that relates that the mass between these two, the Earth and this asteroid, the asteroid can actually be at some distance greater than the radius of the Earth away and still collide. Right? The the asteroid can have some trajectory. Right? It can have a, a, a this parabolic tra trajectory that causes it to fall into Earth um, and still collide with the planet. Um, and so cross-sections capture this idea, right? So at some y away, um, with some velocity, the, the, um, the asteroid will hit, and with some greater velocity or larger y, the asteroid won't hit, right? The interaction won't occur or the collision won't occur. And so cross-sections capture this idea, um, uh, but they do so as, uh, it, but they're measured in terms, in units of energy, or sorry, not energy, they're measured in terms, uh, in units of area, right? So it's as if you took Y as a cross-sectional area that the asteroid would have to pass through at some unit distance X to actually interact with the Earth. Okay, so it's a measurement of uh, how big the effect is. Um, is one way to interpret uh, what a cross section is. And so, if you think of the Earth as being the nucleus of an atom, and um, it, and the asteroid as being a neutron, um, you can derive these cross sections. You could derive a cross section for uh, for what the this Earth asteroid interaction probability as well. Um, 
So um, this is a nice analogy uh, between sort of how neutrons interact on a, a microscopic level with, um, with material. So um, a more macroscopic way of looking at the problem is to send uh, a lot of neutrons into uh, uh, or a bunch of neutrons into a mass of material, right? So um, in mass, you've got a bunch of these little earth targets all over the place or a bunch of little nuclei, nuclei targets sitting in a lot of empty space and you can send a bunch of neutrons in and uh, see how likely it is that um, they'll interact. So, and you can look at the interaction rate. Um, so we can make this selves easier on ourselves by uh, limiting the problem to uh, a collimated beam of monoenergetic, so single energy, all the neutrons start with the same energy, uh, monoenergetic neutrons. Um, and if we aim the target at a very thin foil, um, we can measure how many make it through the foil with the same energy and direction, right? Because if they interact, they're probably going to go off into some other direction. So uh, let's draw this little experiment here. So let's have um, some uh, neutron beam hoops. So I've just drawn a, drawn a few here. Um, let's have a very thin oops, uh, target. So this is our target. And then um, our target foil. Um, and then this is our beam. And so if we have, oops, doop -a -doop -a -doop. nope, neutrons coming in, um, right? This target has some small thickness. So we'll call this thickness um, we'll call the thickness dx and um, we'll also say that it has um, oops, area A Okay. Um, not all of the neutrons are going to make it through, um, right? Some are potentially going to interact. Oops. And so I'll only draw two on that side. So because the neutrons not all interact, you can measure how many you started with versus how many you ended up with. Um, and in particular, this beam is characterized by its current or intensity, so um, uh, which is given the uh, not beam, uh, which is given the 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 well the variable i. by current or intensity. Sometimes these are used interchangeably. And we use I to denote that. Okay. And so um, I is the intensity is equal to the neutron density uh, times the velocity, the neutron velocity, right? So they're monoenergetic neutrons. Um, and so we just have this expression for what 
how they relate to one another. So let's to write these all out. Oops. <laughs> that is not what I wanted to do. <laughs> so n is uh, the neutron density in units of n per centimeter cubed. Um, and uh, V is the speed of the neutrons um, in centimeters per second. Um, and so thus, I has units of neutrons per centimeters squared per second, OK? Um, or centimeters squared seconds, basically. OK. Um, and so by being monoenergetic, whoops, um, into a list so it renders nicely. So by being monoenergetic, we're limiting ourselves to a single neutron speed. So um, uh, we also know that the, um, the number of neutrons traveling through a, the area per second is, so I'll just say, whoop, that is not. Neutrons traveling through the area A per second is given as just I times A. So we have I A, which we can expand out to be N V times A. Okay. Um, now we want to note that the number of target atoms in the target is just given by the number density n, um, so which it times the volume of that target, right? So, um, oops. Uh, so I'll say the number, the total number of target atoms um, is given by the number density n, which has units of, in this case, targets or atoms, which is in a real unit, per centimeter cubed. OK? Uh, times the volume. volume V Wow, not typing well right now uh, <laughs> times centimeter cubed um, which is of course so we have the um, number of targets I do equals NV and the volume of course is the area of that foil uh, multiplied by its thickness right which is just DX so this is NV uh, DX or sorry not NV NA DX okay um, which if we convert to a mass density is just um, Avogadro's number um, times the density rho uh, divided by the mass of the target atom times the area 
uh, times the thickness. Yeah, number of targets. There we go. Okay, so the number of targets equals uh, NV, <laughs> uh, the number density uh, times the volume, which is the number density times the area times the thickness of the foil, which we can convert to the mass density times Avogadro's number divided by the mass of a target atom in AMU um, uh, times the thickness. So let me just get those out here since I defined a couple of uh, new numbers. So this is the mass density, which is in grams per centimeter cubed um, times n sub a, which is Avogadro's number, and then little m here is the uh, mass of the target atom, or target nucleus. Or no, it's actually target atom because we are dealing with electrons. And so that's it, since we're in a material, in a real material. OK. Um, so that's great. <laughs> um, so uh, with all of that being said, um, uh, we um, uh, we can establish what a reaction rate of this material is. So we can say the reaction rate. So how often a target interacts in the foil uh, and this has units of 1 over seconds or frequency. So this is, we'll name this R because we're super creative. Um, <laughs> So R equals I times um, the number of targets, right? So this is N A uh, DX uh, times what we're going to call sigma, which is the cross section, so lowercase sigma, OK? So sigma is there to balance out the units. So right, this has units of number of targets um, uh, per centimeter squared per second. This has units of um, NADX has total units of uh, uh, targets per second. And so we need to get rid of the centimeter squared that's in there. So the sigma is there to ba balance of, out the units. Um, right. So let's say where sigma to balance out units and uh, we'll call sigma is the likelihood of a neutron interacting per target. And this has units of area, so centimeters squared. OK? Um, uh, so sigma is our cross-section. And so if we wanted to redefine this, we could say, or we could rearrange this to be, to say that sigma equals um, 
the reaction rate divided by um, the intensity of the beam times the number density in the beam times the area of the target times the thickness of the target. Or if we wanted to convert that to a mass expression, we would get this is equal to the mass of the tar target atoms times the reaction rate divided by the intensity times Avogadro's number um, times the mass density rho. Okay? Um, so that's what we get. <laughs> um, so furthermore, if we want to go back, we could actually like we could label um, Right, so if we called this side of the expression, given our our units now, if we called this I zero, and we called the intensity over here uh, I one, um, the reaction rate um, we know is oops, the reaction rate is just equal. So to I zero minus I one uh, times the area, right? So I one is our always going to be, or I one is always going to be less than I zero. So this way your reaction rate is always a positive number. Um, and the reason you have to multiply it by the area of the beam, or the area of the target rather, is because um, because you want to get rid of those units. And so really, um, another way to express this is that um, our cross-section sigma is I zero, oops, <laughs> let me do this right. Um, it's I zero minus I one times the area <laughs> uh, divided by I zero, our initial beam intensity, times N times A times uh, DX. And so the thing to notice about that is that the A's here cancel, right? And so, um, because the A's cancel, you get this expression, um, you can get one over, uh, and dx, times 1 minus the fraction I1 over I0 with some simple rearranging. Right? So this is important, right? So the, the, um, the cross-section is independent of the area, right? So it doesn't matter. This intuitively makes sense. It doesn't matter if you have a big target or a little target. The cross section is not shouldn't really be affected by how large your experimental device is. Um, and it also doesn't matter the intensity of the beam, right? Uh, only the relative intensity, the ratio between the two, uh, comes into it. Okay. Um, all right. So I think that's where we'll stop for today. And yeah, uh, good, happy hanging out with you guys.